Thanks for the introduction. So hi, my name is Andrew. Today I'll take you guys through a deep dive into how uh, Spark manages its memory. Um, so I'd like to point out upfront that there will be no demo associated with this talk, unfortunately. However, I'll make it as exciting as if it had one. So first, before I begin, I'd like to take a quick poll. Uh, how many of you here are contributors to Spark? Not many, OK. Uh, how many of you use it in production? Most people, OK. Uh, you're evaluating it. You know, it's like you've read about it. You're not so sure. All right. How many of you have nothing to do with Spark? Come on, it's OK. All right, anyway. So in case not, in case not everyone is super familiar, Spark is a uh, general data processing platform for so-called big data. Uh, it is fast because of many optimizations that are built into it. So first of all, um, the most commonly cited one is perhaps in-memory data sharing. So when Spark first began in the AMP lab at UC Berkeley, uh, Hadoop MapReduce was kind of like the big thing in the industry. So everyone's talking about how massively scalable it was. Uh, what eventually brought Spark into the spotlight, however, uh, was that it realized you don't actually have to persist all the intermediate results to disk, say like after every single reduce. Instead, you could just put them in memory and keep reading it from there. And for many workloads, that was actually much faster. Uh, the Spark guys also realized that if you express the data transformations as a general graph, as opposed to you know, the strict like, map reduce model, then uh, you can do a lot of optimizations like pipelining and lazy evaluation and so on. So, uh, oops, I have a quicker. Uh, so Spark is also fast, not just because uh, it's fast to run. Uh, in particular, it's also fast to write Spark code. And this is because of the simple, uh, simple functional APIs that we offer in a variety of languages and the fact that you can incrementally test out your application in the shell. So other than being fast, Spark is also general. Uh, so over time, Spark has sort of evolved into a platform rather than just an execution engine. So users have found many different use cases that can be expressed on top of Spark elegantly. So for instance, uh, the user might decide to run OLAP queries on top of the query execution engine built on top of Spark, known as Spark SQL. Uh, they may decide to run real-time analysis using Spark Streaming, etc. Spark is also general in the sense that it interoperates with a variety of other systems uh, in the big data ecosystem. So for example, you can read data from HDFS or Cassandra. Uh, you can run Spark using the Yarn Cluster Manager. You can run it on top of uh, Amazon, you know, EC2, and so on. Uh, the company that I work for is called Databricks. We care a lot about Spark uh, because we are the people who created Spark in the first place at UC Berkeley. And we offer a product that looks something like this. Uh, our goal is to make Spark, or more generally, big data easy to use. And with our product, uh, it has like a you know, nice notebook interface. You can make fancy visualizations that look like that. And you don't have to worry about like cluster setup and all of that complexity. So uh, we handle all of that for you. Uh, that's my company. And a little bit about me. I am a committer of the project. And as I mentioned before, I'm a software engineer at Databricks. In the past, I've spoken a little bit at uh, Hadoop Summit, Spark Summit, and other related conferences about Spark. So you may have noticed that the title of this talk is Deep Dive Memory Management in Spark. Now, for those of you who said you had nothing to do with Spark, fortunately, there were none of, none of you, so that was good. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, well, why do I care about you know, a system that I barely, barely use? It's like all the internal details, like I don't really care about that. Uh, well, it turns out that for any distributed computing system out there, memory is an extremely critical resource. And I would even go as far as to say that, uh, go as far to say that efficient memory use is critical to good performance. And everyone cares about good performance because that translates directly to business value. So to illustrate this, I'd like to uh, borrow from Jim Gray's famous analogy about storage latency. So to summarize all the dis distracting graphics on the screen, essentially what he's trying to say is, if reading some piece of data from memory is like going to Sacramento, which takes 90 minutes from, from, from here or Berkeley, then picking up the same piece of data from disk is like going all the way to Pluto, which is really, really far in comparison. So how this ap applies to Spark is that uh, where possible, we try really hard not to write any data to disk if we didn't have to. 
Instead, if we just keep reading things from memory, then we can bypass the trip to Pluto. And in an environment like Spark, memory is always a constrained resource, simply because if you had more memory, then you can process more data while spilling less to disk. So, uh, however, unfortunately, everyone wants memory. You know, uh, it, within a system like Spark, there's a lot of sources of, many sources of uh, contention for memory that makes the whole uh, system for managing memory in Spark very difficult. In particular, uh, there's memory contention between the two main use cases of uh, memory in Spark, execution and storage. In the next slide, I'll go into what these mean exactly. There's also a lot of memory contention across task running in parallel. Uh, in Spark, a task is a, a small unit of execution that represents a partition in your data. So for example, if your data set has 200 partitions, then your Spark application is gonna launch 200 tasks, and each worker is gonna try to run as many of those tasks in parallel as possible. So uh, while the tasks are running at the same time, they're gonna try to grab memory. Uh, each of them is gonna try to grab memory, and you have to decide how much memory to give to each one of them. Uh, further, with, even within a task, there is memory contention across operators. I'm gonna, also going to come back to this uh, in a little bit, but for now you can think of operators as uh, something you do to your data. So for example, uh, sort or a group by. All right, so I mentioned earlier that there are two main uh, usages of memory in Spark, and they are execution and storage. So in a nutshell, execution is kind of like the memory that you use to process data right now. Uh, so for example, when you're doing a sort, you have to read all the data uh, in before you can return anything because uh, you need to find the minimum before you can you know, start returning the results. So uh, a common way to do it is to read it into a buffer, maybe an array or something, and then, uh, and then sort it there. So the memory that you use there is called execution memory. Uh, storage refers to the memory that you, you use to cache things uh, that will be used in the future rather than right now. So storage is kind of like an optimization, but it's a very important one that distinguishes uh, Spark from other big, data eco uh, other big data systems. So to illustrate this more concretely in an example, suppose you're trying to sort a bunch of integers, uh, and what you have is an iterator. So uh, an iterator can only be traversed once, so you have to buffer everything uh, either in memory or if it doesn't fit in memory, then you have to spill some of it to disk, right? Okay, so the memory used here is called execution memory, and then you might run some sort algorithm like timsort, for example, that's what we use in Spark. Uh, we sorted it, and then we return an iterator. So that's execution memory. And then let's say we take this iterator and we apply some transformation to it. So uh, let's say we add one to every single item in this iterator, and we produce a new iterator and we might try to consume this iterator perhaps by summing up all the values. Um, so the next time, however, uh, the next time you try to get the same iterator, you're gonna have to traverse the entire chain of computation. Right? There's just no other way to, to get uh, the iterator because you know, by definition they can only be traversed once. And this could be very expensive because you know, you'd be sorting it again even though you've already sorted it in the past. So usually when, um, when you know that a particular data set will be used again in the future, it's generally a good idea to cache it in memory. So for instance here, we cache the sorted values in memory and uh, all subsequent computations will just read from memory instead of you know, doing the sorting again. So the memory used to cache the iterator here is called storage memory. Is that clear to everyone? Yeah, okay. Oops, whoops. So uh, the first challenge then uh, to manage memory in Spark is to arbitrate memory between execution and storage. So how do we decide how much memory to you know, give to the sort or, um, or to caching? So perhaps the simplest solution here is simply you know, static allocation. And what this means effectively is you have, uh, here's your total available memory. You assign a chunk only for execution and then uh, you reserve another fraction only for storage, and they can't use each other's spaces. Right? This is what we've been, we had been using since Spark 1.0 like two years ago. 
So as an example, uh, let's say I'm sorting, so you know, I'm like acquiring more memory here. And then some other task is acquiring some memory for storage and so on, right? So there's a lot of acquisitions here. And finally, uh, the task that I was sorting realizes that there's no more memory for execution. So it has no choice but to spill to disk. And remember, this could be an expensive operation. So uh, it's better to try to avoid this where possible. So we spilled that to disk, did some IO, and then let's say storage you know, keeps going. And similarly, when storage hits the boundary, it's going to evict the least to disk. Um, in Spark, the unit of storage is a block, which you can think of as a partition of your data. All right. So I mentioned earlier that uh, efficient memory use is critical to good performance. However, the flip side is also true, that inefficient memory use uh, effectively means bad performance. So uh, back in this example, what's the problem with static allocation? Well, if we're not using any of the storage memory, then really the execution memory could have used the entire uh, JVM heap, but that's not actually the case here. Uh, it's because simply that we reserved a chunk of memory only for storage in the beginning and execution cannot borrow from it. So uh, doing something like a sort will end up having to spill to disk uh, and do a lot more IOs much more often than is necessary. So you might say, well, what if, you know, I'm, I'm the user, I know my application the best, what if I'm not caching anything? So I tell Spark that uh, allocate no memory for storage because I'm not going to use it. Uh, that's okay. I mean, that's actually the solution that we have been using since Spark 1.0. However, it's not super user friendly because the user now has to think about execution memory versus storage and they have to understand all the low level details. So let's fast forward to, um, to May 2016. What are some things that we could have done better? Well, so the problem originally was that uh, execution could not use the entire JVM heap, even if there's no caching. So what if, uh, so here we're sorting, what if we just let the sort operator, you know, borrow from the storage space like this, okay? Uh, and then after it's done, it's going to release some memory. So, uh, so this is what I call unified memory management, uh, which effectively says there's only one unified uh, space that execution and storage share. So it's not like preserved in advance, reserved in advance uh, which one gets how much. And this has been the case since Spark 1.6. So uh, the critical thing to, to note here is that uh, in this particular example, the sort didn't actually have to do any disk I.O. at all. It didn't have to spill to disk because there's no need to. You know, the memory is big enough to fit all of the sorted of data. But in the previous case, it would have spilled to disk and that would have been much slower. So this is kind of like a silly example where there's no storage. Uh, now let's say there is, so what happens? So you know, we're sorting, we're sorting, we're trying to acquire more memory for sorting. Uh, and then we try to acquire more memory, but there's, not, uh, there's simply not enough. So we're going to evict some blocks to disk, right? And then we're gonna keep going and evict more blocks if necessary, okay? So this is what happens with unified memory management. What about the other way around? So let's say there's like some memory on each side and then we're putting in more blocks, we're putting in more blocks and uh, we try to acquire more memory for putting in a block but there is not enough. So instead of spilling execution here, however, uh, the storage will spill itself. So effectively you're freeing up space um, by kicking out older blocks to accommodate your new block. So there are some design considerations here, right? Um, you notice that in both cases, we decided to evict storage as opposed to execution memory. Why do we you know, make that decision? Well, so the main reason is because spilled execution data is always gonna be read back from disk, right? So you're always gonna incur some disk IO there, whereas cache data may not be. So uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that I've seen many users, you know, they, they just abuse the cache operator in Spark. You know, they put cache after every single line thinking, that it would make things faster, but uh, at worst, it would you know, destroy your cache locality, and it's really not recommended. Uh, perhaps more common people cache a lot of things and they never uncache it, so you, know, you have this uh, data in your memory that you're never gonna use, and meanwhile, that space is not available to 
you know, to computation. So you're going to have to like spill to this unnecessarily. So, uh, so this is why we prefer to evict storage rather than execution. It's because uh, for storage, you know, you may never have to read them back. Uh, well, you might say, well, my graph, my, my application is like some graph heavy uh, computation, involves a lot of graph heavy computation, uh, which relies on caching. So I'm going to have to uh, keep reading from the same data set over and over again. So that, you know, if we do exactly what I did there earlier, then you'd destroy my, you know, my application. So to fix that, uh, we allow the user to specify a minimum amount of cached data that will never be evicted. You know, uh, this is not a reservation, uh, which is different from the static allocation model uh, in the sense that it's not reserved in the beginning. So if you don't end up caching any data, you can still use that space for, for execution. All right, so perhaps that was the hardest uh, challenge to solve. Um, however, once we figure that out, we still have to figure out how to arbitrate memory across task running in parallel. Um, so as an example of this, uh, perhaps uh, suppose my worker has four cores. Uh, perhaps the simplest approach we can do here, once again, is static allocation, which says each task gets exactly one fourth of the total memory, and the amount of memory that each task uh, actually uses is completely independent of uh, what other tasks use. So for instance, I have four tasks, you know, they, they just use some arbitrary amount of memory. Let's say the task in slot three finishes. So the problem here now is there are only three active tasks, but, uh, but, neither, but none of the running tasks can use any of the memory that was allocated for uh, slot three, even though you know, there's like, it's just not being used. So that's, an, uh, that's another source of memory inefficiency. So instead, what Spark does is essentially uh, allow the share of each task to depend on the number of actively running tasks rather than like the total uh, maximum you know, possible running tasks in the system. So for, for instance, here I only have run ta one task running. It can use up all the space that it wants. Right? But as soon as another task comes in, this first task is going to have to spill to disk. Uh, this is because we want, we want the memory allocation to be fair in addition to uh, efficient. So it's going to spill to disk. And essentially, now we have two slots as before. So they're going to take up some memory in their slots, and so on. Right? If more tasks come in, we're going to force the existing ones to spill. So uh, if you compare, oh, sorry. Um, so the benefit here is that, uh, let's say all the other tasks finish. So task three is the last remaining one. It actually gets all the memory, because the number of active, active tasks is now equal to one. So this is. Uh, this is a solution for mitigating stragglers, which are essentially tasks that uh, take so long that they block the entire execution from completing. And this has been the case in Spark 1.0 two years ago. Uh, it's been used by a lot of companies in production. We haven't had much problem with it. So if you, look, if you try to compare these two solutions, uh, you quickly notice that there are more similarities than differences. Uh, in particular, it's easy to know that both of them are fair and starvation-free. For static allocation, it's pretty much the definition of fair. Like you can't, you literally can't get more fair than that. Um, as as for what Spark does, it's pretty similar to the static allocation case in terms of fairness, uh, because you know it is essentially doing the same thing except the slots are determined dynamically rather than uh, rather than yeah they're determined dynamically. Uh, an obvious advantage of static allocation is that it's simpler, but then what Spark does handles stragglers, which are like the last remaining task, you know, a little better. Finally, uh, the last challenge that I wanted to talk about today is how to arbitrate memory across uh, operators running in the same task. So to give you a quick example of what I mean by that, suppose I'm running a simple query, um, you know, I'm computing the average heights per age and ordering them by, the, by that average height. Right? So there are two ways of expressing this. First, you can write a, sim a simple SQL query like the one at the top, or you can use Spark's data frame syntax um, like the bottom to express it in a more sort of functional way. So uh, these two both produce the same uh, query execution plan on the, on the left that you see right there. 
So it's going to start by scanning your data, you know, projecting some columns, and then computing the average, that's the aggregate, and finally sorting it. So let's say in this example, uh, the worker has six pages of memory. So a page here is a fixed size of, uh, is a fixed chunk uh, of memory that your JVM has, and it's going to allocate them to the operators. So scan and project, they don't really use much memory. They use some, but like compared to aggregate and sort, they really don't use anything at all. So let's say in this particular example, aggregate is like super memory intensive. It grabs all the pages very quickly. And what is it using the memory for? Well, to build a map that looks like this. Uh, because we're computing average, we could technically have stored uh, the sum of all the heights and the total number of heights to, to compute the average uh, later. But let's say for simplicity, you know, we just naively store all the heights. And then finally, when we get to sort, uh, while the system doesn't have any more memory, so you know, sort just can't do anything. It doesn't even have a page of working memory to work with. So this is what I mean by uh, memory contention between, in this example, sort and aggregate. So there are several solutions here. Right? The first simpler one is to simply reserve a page for each operator. So in this example, uh, I would reserve a page for aggregate and sort because those actually use memory. Right? Um, so this does work. However, there's one problem. Uh, if we keep going with this, then aggregate's gonna get five pages, right? And then sort's gonna have one. Uh, it is now starvation-free, but it's still not really fair. So sort's gonna keep spilling to disk, and you know, that's gonna eventually make your application run slower. So it's still not fair. Uh, perhaps the bigger problem here is it's not really scalable either. Like what if I had more operators. In this particular example, I only had two, but like if I had seven, then we just can't simply reserve a page for every operator. So by the way, uh, this is not just like some silly approach that I, I thought of like to make the real one look better. This is actually a real approach that we uh, decided in Spark and then later decided to revise it because of uh, uh, real workloads that we observed. So um, that's why I'm talking about it. So now for the slightly better approach that is in fact in Spark. Uh, what we could do instead is something called cooperative spilling. So let's say aggregate once again takes up all the pages and then when sort tries to acquire memory it realizes that there are none. So what it's going to do is force aggregate to spill the page to free memory. So effectively it steals the page from aggregate. So then let's say you know sort is like uh, expanding its array so it's trying to get more memory. So what it's going to do now is keep forcing aggregate to spill um, until it finishes. So let's say it finishes with three pages. So now um, aggregate doesn't have to spill its remaining pages. So this kind of ties back to the principle I talked about earlier where uh, we try to keep as many things resident in memory where possible so we don't have to go all the way to Pluto. Right? In this example, you can see that uh, it is fair in, in the sense that you know, both sort and aggregate end up with three pages, but even if sort takes up all the pages from aggregate, it's still fair. And this is because aggregate must have already finished by the time st sort started. So uh, it doesn't actually need new pages. So it can spill at most you know, six pages. All right, and this is uh, implemented since Spark 1.6, which is available uh, the since the beginning of this year. All right, so as a quick recap, uh, there are three major sources of contention that makes uh, memory management difficult in Spark. In particular, they are uh, arbitrating memory between the two main usages, execution and storage, across tasks running in parallel, and across operators running in the same task. So perhaps the, uh, the central motivating, motivating theme uh, across all three of them is that instead of statically reserving memory in advance, simply allow everyone to you know, take a chunk of it uh, whenever they want. However, um, when there is memory contention, when someone's getting more than their fair share, uh, impose you know, fairness by forcing them to spill. So this is the heart of uh, essentially the memory management in Spark. <coughs> so uh, I can't give a talk about Spark memory without also mentioning Project Tungsten. How many of you have heard of Tungsten? Uh, that's more than I thought, actually. So uh, what it is, essentially, is 
uh, a project to leverage the low level, you know, byte level semantics of data in Spark. So to push uh, computation to, you know, closer to the hardware where possible. So this has three major parts. I'm only going to talk about the first two since the third one is kind of unrelated uh, to this talk. So the first one is uh, storing data as like bytes, you know, in memory as compactly as possible. And the second one is uh, taking advantage of the fact that, uh, you know, memory is a lot faster in disk, but L1, 2, 3 caches are a lot faster than memory. So let me talk about the first one first. Um, so Java objects in general, they have very large overheads. So for a simple string like ABCD, you really only need four bytes to actually encode it. Uh, but then in Java, this string becomes 48 bytes. It has like a bunch of unnecessary things that you really don't care about. Um, so if we use Java objects to represent a row, you know, that's even worse because now we have all these wrappers. You know, we box integers and other primitives. Um, we have a lot of random overhead and hash code is more expensive because you have to traverse all the pointers uh, independently. So instead, what Spark does using tungsten is represent each row uh, as, you know, just bytes. So essentially, for primitive types, we know exactly how big they are, so we, we just like encode them in the row um, directly. For variable length data, like strings, we store a pointer that points to uh, first the length of the string and then finally the data itself. So you don't have to worry about the details here, but uh, the, the takeaway here is if you store things as compactly as possible, you know, you have more space to work with, that reduces garbage collection overheads, you have better cache locality, there are a lot of other benefits. Uh, one other benefit that's not really related to memory here is that you don't really have to serialize and deserialize your data all the time anymore because it's already, you know, this is already serialized, it's like in bytes. And also you can work uh, directly on top of the serialized form of the data because you know exactly uh, where the fields are because the offsets are determined by you, not by some random, you know, uh, compiler. And the second part of tungsten that I want to talk about is uh, taking level, uh, taking advantage of the uh, L123 caches as opposed to just memory. So for example, if you want to sort a simple list of records, uh, a very common way to do it is to just sort the pointer itself. So this is, however, a naive layout in the sense that uh, every time you want to dereference, every time you want to compare two pointers, you're gonna have to make two memory accesses. So you're gonna have to go to Sacramento twice. That's actually quite expensive. What you could do better instead is to simply store the key that you're sorting, um, or at least part of it, right alongside with the pointer. So you don't actually have to uh, dereference a pointer. You could directly compare the two key prefixes. So this is a cache aware layout leads to a better cache locality. All right. So, uh, that's actually all I have. I ended up speaking much quicker than I thought I, than I, than I had planned. Uh, I guess we're going to break out into questions now. Can you talk about the offbeat nature of strings? Like yeah. <clears throat> I actually had a slide in there, but I, I thought that, hey. Repeat the questions, please. Oh, sorry. Um, the question was, can you talk about the offbeat nature of things? Um, yeah, I thought that actually I wouldn't have time to talk about it, but I guess I do now. Um, so in Spark, you can, uh, you can both do execution and storage off heap in the sense that uh, when you cache something, you, know, you, can, you don't have to put it in the, in the heap. And like when you do sorting, also you can acquire memory from outside of the heap as well. So uh, the few ma major advantages here are that, uh, first of all, uh, you can scale the size of your working memory without regard to problems with large heaps, like you know, crazy garbage collections that could occur for minutes you know, when you have hundreds of uh, gigabytes. So that's, that's usually very expensive. Um, so that's perhaps the biggest thing. Uh, other smaller motivations for off-heap you know, could be zero copy IO when you, um, when you try to write something that's already in memory directly to disk or like to, um, to some other uh, over or when you're trying to send it over the network, uh, you, do, you don't have to do another copy when you do that. Um, so both of these combined will likely make your application run faster. That's the high level 
So off heap is available since 1.6. Yeah, so um, even before that, however, your heap size can be however large you want, just that you're going to suffer from garbage collection issues. Yeah. Yes? So like with, with off heap, then you want to study like your cache, and, um, then you'd be able to use like Yeah, so currently, so in the future, that could be the case where you store something off heap and then another process, maybe not Spark, uh, some, something else other than Spark could read that data. Um, currently, however, the format in which we store them is like only Spark knows about it. So other things can't just go ahead and read it. Um, but, you know, like off heap is like the first step towards that. You can share data more efficiently. What about Alexio with like coprocessing? Yeah, so. Um, Integration with Tachyon, so, oh, sorry, uh, it's now called Elixio. Uh, integration with Elixio is uh, also something that a lot of people want. Um, so from Databricks side, at least, there are no active uh, you know, developments towards that. Um, however, Elixio, the company, they, they might have something, I don't know. Well, the, the processing enables another type of workload that people want Yeah. There's definitely a lot of motivation to do it. Yeah, so actually, um, open source Spark is only a small part of Databricks. Databricks, uh, essentially, its goal is to make Spark easy to use. And to, to achieve that, it has like a whole product where you, know, uh, you go there, you ask for a couple of nodes, and then you have a nice interface in which you can run Spark jobs. And then the results are going to come back to you in, uh, user understand, in, in a user-friendly format. And that's like, you know, ideal for people like data scientists and data engineers. Oh, sorry. Uh, first. Uh, can I monitor execution and storage memory in Spark device? That's a good question. Um, for storage, you can. Yeah, course, yeah. Yes. For execution, you currently cannot. <laughs> So, sorry, I, I realize I haven't been repeating questions. So, if I understand correctly, your question is uh, are there metrics or um, you know, visualizations to show like how uh, storage and execution, you know, how much of those are used? Not, not necessarily visualization, even in the raw uh, text format. Some yeah. Um, so, I, I'm not sure if you or the audience is familiar with the Spark UI, which is, yeah, which is. Um, basically like a, a user interface for knowing more about your application. So currently, uh, the Spark UI stores information about uh, how, much how many blocks are stored in memory on which node. Uh, all of that information is in the Spark UI. However, that only applies to storage. Uh, execution, currently there's, I believe there's no information on Spark UI about that yet, but we, we could add that. But I think that information is also there in the raw data form that we can use in the Yes, uh, that is currently not there.
I see. I, I'm personally not aware of any active plans to integrate with Arrow. Um, so unfortunately, I, I don't think I can. Yeah, I just don't know. Uh, yes. You talked about all of this uh, memory sharing between operators. Uh, has there been any thought about sharing memory between tasks? So if I have four parallel tasks, three of which use very little memory, one of which one a lot. You talk uh, about sharing this. memory across tasks. So like, could a task borrow memory from other tasks? Yeah. So uh, the question is. Is there any plans or, or like uh, any memory sharing across tasks? Um, so currently, the only memory, the only so-called memory sharing across tasks, is uh, is not like the contents of the memory, but rather than, than but but rather the space itself. Uh, yeah. So um, so I don't know if uh, so. Let's see. Yeah, so, so the, the memory sharing model across the task uh, in Spark right now is if another task comes in, you know, it like forces existing task to spill, and so um, it does like arbitrary fairness that way. I, I'm not sure that answers your question. Uh, yes? So uh, besides the memory, uh, Yeah, so, oh, um, well, the question is very long, so I, I'm not going to repeat it. But essentially, uh, so we don't want people to have to, uh, have to tweak the memory settings to get the ideal workload. Uh, what we want, at least in Spark 2.0 onwards, uh, and per probably in the Spark 1.6 onwards, is that you just start your application, it just picks the, you know, the best settings for you, and it just like, runs without any memory problems. So that's the goal that we want. Um, however, if before, say like 1.6, that you do have to uh, tweak various settings to avoid like out of memory errors or or even like very slow application, you know, that's like that's not intentional. <laughs> but uh, I mean, you still have to specify Yes. Yes. So memory management is very closely associated with uh, concurrency, right? And we have faced a lot of issues with concurrency of Spark. So will the improved memory management address some concurrency issues? Uh, for example, can, can you give? Uh, if we are hitting, say, 500 concurrent users to the system, right now Spark doesn't scale for concurrency. So will this improved memory management will help for concurrency? Do you mean 500 people sharing the same like driver or like it's the same, same cluster? Yes. Um, and all 500 of them are like running right. jobs in parallel. Our user base is very good, maybe 3,000, and so even we consider 10% uh, or 1% is the concurrent users. Say 500 is the concurrent user number. Is it really get the same queries or different queries? Then? Yeah. So. Right, uh, so the question is roughly, sorry, um, does the new uh, mem unified memory management model do anything to address the concurrency issues seen in like shared clusters? Uh, so uh, to address that, I think uh, the biggest thing that might be relevant here is perhaps the fact that previously if you cache something, that's basically always going to be there unless like someone also caches other things. Uh, whereas now, Whereas now, uh, even if you don't explicitly encache uh, whatever you cache, then it will be thrown out of the cache uh, because execution will like kick it out. So this guards against people who misuse you know, the caching operator, for example. Um, so I believe that's time. But uh, if I didn't answer any of your questions fully, or if you have you know, more questions, feel free to come to me. Happy to talk. Thank you.